Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. So it's going to be following the same vein uh, of last week. And, um, and I, think, I think it's a season for us, you know, for, you know, for seeking the Lord, isn't it? It's an, been on a war footing, as I put it, as such. You know, sometimes, you know, we, you know, Lynn says this, you know, sometimes the word sometimes, and it's, it seems to be on that kind of edge where I see something uh, that's unfolding before us. Stuart brought out a little bit about our government and the laws that are actually afflicting us. I kind of brought out that with the Maccabees, you know, the Hellenization with the Greeks coming in, and they actually then tried to destroy our Judean Christian moral code, and they flooded us with a, a, a filthy, worldly, immoral culture and then they started to persecute us and force us to be obedient to these new laws we just heard Stuart saying that as well this morning what our government is doing and also that our government now is refusing to recognize your gender according to your biological sex they, they are now are saying that you know if somebody changes their sex we have got to acknowledge them in their recognized um, identity whatever that might be and if you refuse to do that you're going to be penalized the law is going to come, and these laws are now going to be enforced against us. And it was always a, it was always a goal getter. I think that Labour were always going to do that. So we're living in that climate when everything now is attacking us. It's been attacking us for a long time, and um, and I think the theme last week was it's time for us to fight back and probably get Stuart to preach on that Jehoshaphat sermon. And um, when their back was against the wall, Hallelujah. Sometimes that is when the church needs to rise up. But we're, we're back's been against the wall for a long time, and I believe the Lord is calling his church now. It's probably time for us to stand up and to fight back. We've been sitting back too long, too passive, just as it was in those days, and maybe the theme will go into that this morning. So let us remember the word of God is living and active. See those stained glass windows behind us? That's Hebrews 4 and 12 in stained glass, believe it or not. So the word of God is living and active, sharpening a double-edged sword, penetrating soul, spirit, bone marrow, judging the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Someone once came in here and says, Arthur, you go to that church and you expect to see you know, crosses. Well, that cross was fairly new. It never used to be there. It says, oh, I see in here is swords. In case you missed it, there's a big claymore sword sitting right up there on that beam. And everybody walks. It's amazing when you see a sword up there. You tend to kind of walk. It is secure. And, um, but we're insured anyway. <laughs> Just joking. Just joking. In case it falls. It's well secured. And, um, but really, the sword is representative to the word of God. Can I just clarify that? People think because we're in the land of the birth, birth of William Wallace. That sword represents the word of God. It's sharp. It's sharp and double-edged. Hallelujah. It's the word of God. It's alive. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It should challenge us. The Word of God is there to challenge us, to stir us up. It's not there to tickle our ears and pacify our hearts. And for far too long, I think people are looking for a nice church where we can just be chilled and relaxed and everything's nice and easy. And thank God there can be moments for that too. But the Word of God should be challenging us. It should always be challenging us. It should be pushing us. It should be, it should be prodding us. You know, it should be disturbing us. When I was a young Christian, I came in and I remember Ben Pitou. And for some of you, I sat under Ben Pitou's ministry. It was always challenging, always faith, always stretching you and causing you to, to take steps to go forward. And every time he spoke, I always took it personally. Do you ever get that? I mean, I was like, you know, and it's like, he's, I allowed it to affect me. And it wasn't just a, a bland word, but I brought the word, I personalized it to say, what is that saying to me? I would pray when I came to church, Lord, speak to me through that word. And then I took it personally and I challenged myself to just to, to, to be more than what I wanted to be. Hallelujah. And here I find myself now in a place of being called a pastor. Actually, if you go way back to my past life, this is a bit of a miracle. Amen. And, you know, I still meet people who haven't seen me for years and, you know, they just think, what? When they hear that story, glory to God. Surely not him, but I suppose everyone says that. God has got a habit of choosing the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Well, that's my default scripture that I go back to. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Anyway, the scripture reading today, I'm just going to be one verse here, and it's Ezekiel. And it's 22 and verse 30. And let me open up the book of Ezekiel to us this morning. Father, bless your word. We thank you, Father, for your word. It's living and active. It's sharp and a double-edged sword. Father, let it penetrate us this morning. Lord, let it touch our hearts this day. Let it stir up our hearts. Let it encourage us in our, in our Father, our innermost being. Lord, cause it, Father, to, to do its work in us, Lord God, Father. Lord, open up everyone's ears today, Lord, and let them hear your voice, not my voice, Lord, your voice, Lord God, Father, as I open up this word, Lord, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Glory to God. Ezekiel, sorry, Ezekiel chapter 20, 22, verse 30. Twenty-two and verse thirty, Hallelujah! And it says this: So I sought for a man among them who would who would make a wall, stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Therefore, I had to pour out my indignation on them and consume them with my fire and my wrath. For I recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Amen. But just that one verse that says there, he looked for a man to stand to make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not have to destroy it. It's quite a powerful verse, that one. Hallelujah. What we see here very clearly, though, is our God is gracious and merciful, and he does not desire to destroy anyone. But God is merciful and desires everyone to come to a place of salvation. We always have to remember that. That's what causes us to go out in the streets. And I forgot that announcement. 12 o'clock, we meet here, and we go out into the streets of Paisley. Maybe we'll drop into Johnson. Who knows? But again, it's for us to be reaching out. Amen. For God does not desire to see the death of anyone, but God would rather that they would turn to him in repentance that he can forgive them and pour out his blessings upon them. What an amazing God that we serve this day. And the reason God is here, you've been saying God's been going to come back for years, exactly because the Lord is very, giving everyone a great opportunity to turn from their ways. So he's very gracious and long-suffering. I thank God that God is long-suffering, or else I probably wouldn't be here today because I resisted him for quite a number of years when he started to break into my life here. So we can see here very clearly, if you actually look at the context, I read the one verse from the, at the very end of that chapter, and I'm not going to go through the whole chapter again, but there was the great sins of Jerusalem and Israel in particular. They had rebelled against the order of God. We, you have a whole list of the abominations that they were committing before the Lord. And, um, and, 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 and even their leaders were very wicked. Even in the church, we've seen there was wicked leaders who went off the rails, who were false prophets and false teachers. And the whole place was in a mess. Hallelujah. But God says, but I looked for someone that might stand in the gap. If we just go back to Ezekiel, further back. In fact, all the chapters leading up to that is all about the Lord reaching out, sending his prophets to them to try and turn them from their apostasy and from their wickedness. In Ezekiel 13, it says this, and the word of the Lord came to me saying this, son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own hearts, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirits and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the deserts, for you have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel, to stand in, the, in battle on the day of the Lord. For they have not went into that place to stand before God, to intercede for the people. That's the job of a prophet. Today, and nothing's really changed in 2 Timothy 4 and 1 to 4, and I just want to bring some New Testament, you know, um, you know just muscle to what I've actually just said here. Everybody says, oh, it's always the Old Testament. But we can fast forward it. People are always going to be people. And we'll see that in, even in the church today and this nation that I've just been speaking about also. Second Timothy 4, 3, it says this, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. Amen. So we can see that there. They will, they will bring teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. What, not what you need to hear, but I wanted somebody to tell me what I want to hear. Hallelujah. So if I'm living a life kind of half-baked, I want a kind of half-baked minister that's going to be preaching, that's all going to be nice things. It's not going to disturb me in my half-bakedness because I want to be feeling happy. I want to be feeling content. I don't want to be feeling convicted. I just want to be feeling nice and happy. And there is some nice and happy messages within me as well, I might add. But I feel as if... The particular time and seasons that we are moving into, I believe we are living in the last days. I think everyone will agree as we see the state of our nation, we see the laws that are coming against us, when we see the, 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 the road that we're on, it will tell you very clearly that the second return of the Lord Jesus Christ is close. Hallelujah. Far closer than any of us would even care to think. The signs are there. We see the seasons are there. Everything that we're going to, Jesus says, as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so it shall be in the latter days. Don't you think this place has become like, I think we've just become so normalized everything. There is nothing sacred anymore. Nothing sacred. 
I mean, we just have to look at the people going out there. We just need to look at the dress code and everything now today. There is nothing left to the imagination. I told you I just came back from holiday. And virtually I told you this, you will be seeing full nudity on our beaches probably within two years. You've nearly got it just now when you go to these Sunshine Islands. It's difficult to walk in the beach because you don't know where to look. You know, it's like, it, it's just now, and that's the comment. And it's been like that for a long time. But I want to tell you this, we will be moving to the point now when everything is going to get to such degradation. It will be unbelievable. We're actually probably there because the television is full of it, isn't it? I mean, I grew up with the days with John Boy and uh, and, the, and the Waltons. <laughs> I mean, it was honestly, you know, I, I grew up in the days at 11 o'clock. It was the late call. Remember those days when, when the nation finished and it was the word of God that finished us off? That shows you how ancient I am. I'm a bit of a dinosaur. Uh, black and white TVs. Amen. But that was when a nation finished. The night came at 11 o'clock and there was, you had late call for five minutes. And you finish with the word of God. Now, whether you, whatever. And then you get the wee, beep. And then the TV would come alive again the next day. And it was only a couple of channels. Now it's a wash with channels. I don't know how many channels. Thousands, thousands. And, and everything is just it was full of everything. Amen. Thank God for those days. Now, let me go back. I read, I read a psalm um, to start us off this morning. So I'm going to quote one verse from that as I start to kind of push into the word today. Amen. So in Psalm 94, in verse 16, and, and here, the, here we hear this with the psalmist that says this, Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Two question marks. Two. You know. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? And, and who will stand for me against the workers of iniquity? The psalmist is asking the question, we could say the Spirit of God is asking that very same question today. You know, we have a kind of sense today is, well, I'm, you ever heard that expression? I'm all right, Jack. How are you doing? I'm all right, Jack. I'm doing okay. I'm all right, Jack. Which really is a very self-centered thing. I'm okay. And really, at the end of the day, I don't care about anybody else. It's kind of self-centered. As long as I'm okay, everything's wonderful. And it's more and more, we're in a culture today where everybody's kind of living for themselves. We, we don't tend to look further out there about the poor, the needy. We kind of concentrate, as long as I'm doing okay, that's fine. I'm all right, Jack, is that expression. It's very kind of selfish expression, meaning I'm okay. As long as I'm okay, it's okay. Actually, to spiritualize that, for you to say, I'm all right, Jack, really what you should be saying is, you're a jackass. <laughs> a jackass means you're a stupid person in the kingdom of God because you don't see the bigger picture. You're, close, you're, you're living your own wee bubble. And my wee bubble's fine, but actually you're not looking outside the bubble. And you know what? God never asked us to live in a bubble. God has asked us to be part of his kingdom and we should be looking outside that and we should be having the heart of the Lord. Praise his wonderful name. So what we see here, so God is looking for to raise up warriors and I want to bring that word to you today. There could be warriors in this room. We should all be warriors, actually we are. Men after his own heart, hallelujah, who will do all his will. Do you know we are called not to do our will? But We say that prayer every morning, don't we? The Our Father prayer. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. But we say in the earth, but really then, really you should be identifying yourself. Lord, thy kingdom come and thy will be done in my life. In my life. And then we, in the life of my brothers and sisters, in the life, you, you will to be done upon this earth. But for that to be done, that's, that's a kind of big blank one, isn't it? Lord, your kingdom come and, and, and your will be done in all the earth. No, your kingdom come and your will be done in my life. First, <laughs> When you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you've opened yourself up. You're no longer part of the normal kingdom. You're part of his kingdom. I've been translated, and I'm now in the kingdom of God. We are not waiting, guys, to be part of the kingdom of God. We are the part of the kingdom of God now. Just read John 17. Father, they've accepted my word. They're no longer of this world. Neither am I of the world because they've received my word. They have now been taken out of this world, and we're in the kingdom of God just now. Do you know that? Hallelujah. We're waiting for the fulfillment of that when Jesus comes, but I'm in the kingdom of God now. I'm a kingdom of God man. Hallelujah. I sometimes say jokingly, maybe a couple of times I'm walking through the streets of Glasgow and nobody notices me. And I says, Lord, they don't even notice me, but I belong to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. As I'm walking through the streets, I'm a son of God and nobody even knows I'm here, but you do. Amen. 
See, when you can get that into yourself and you speak it into yourself, I'm a child of God, I belong to the kingdom of God, we should be speaking that more and more into ourselves because it's so easy to get trapped into this world, this kingdom, and never become a servant to the ways of this kingdom. We are not called to be servants to the ways of this kingdom. We are to be servants to the king of kings and his kingdom it should be dominating our life. That's why when we pray in the mornings, we pray for those in authority. Those, you know, there's a lot of Christian men and women in politics just now. And whether it's the Labour Party, whether it's the Conservative Party, Liberal Democrats, Reform, SNP, I better say every party in case I upset somebody. <laughs> All the parties. But you know something, you know, when Labour and SNP did that was, you have to be faithful to the manifesto. You weren't allowed to vote out with, when the majority said something, whatever nature that was, even though you were a Christian, you were forced to vote to go with the, with the majority decision. And I would always say this, if I was a Christian and I was in politics, my first concern is to this book, to this word. That is the rule. That is the, that's what I am being called to first and foremost. So whether I was in politics or whatever field I was in, I, this is my manifesto. I have to be true to this and I need to stand up for this. And how they can sit there and just give a nod to a lot of this, the, the, the wickedness that's going on, abortion and all of the rest of it, and I would vote for it. People are wanting to push the abortion date to, you know, to, to nine months now. Do you know this is what, there was somebody, there's a move in politics just now to say, let's move abortion now to nine months on delivery. And do you know the reasoning behind that, that they would say that is, well, a baby's not, you know how they say just now, a baby can only, what they say is, like 22 weeks, they say, before that, it's not a baby, it's a fetus. Listen, at the moment of conception, it is a baby. At the moment of conception, it is a baby. But now, different nations have got different, you know, well, 12 weeks, some are 14 weeks, some are 22 weeks. There is a move just now who want to move it to birth. And then what they're saying is, well, actually, it's not really a baby because it's not at its mother's milk, it's not at any human touch, it's not at any human action. So really, it's still just, you know, it's just a, it's just a body, but it's not at any human touch. So let's just, we can then justify maybe killing that baby. Listen, you can Google that for yourself, but I'm saying that whether that ever happens, um, who knows? But I'm just saying that is the way that the world is wanting to go now. There's no value. Stuart spoke about assisted suicide, you know, and it's really assisted suicide. I mean, when people are really struggling, and there's a lot of people struggling. I've been through phases in my life when I just thought, what's the point of living? I think if we're all honest, you ever get those moments? I've been through some dark nights of the soul when I thought, well, goodness sake, it's better not being here. Thank God, I want friends around me. He says, come on, Arthur, let, I'll come over and visit you. Come on, we'll go out for a wee meal. Come on, let's, you know, and somebody gets around me and wants to just kind of build me up. That's the people you need. You don't want a bunch of people that say, well, okay, well, come on, we can help you. No, I don't. I want, I want people that's going to restrain me, not help me. And this government always, they always come out with the worst case scenarios, don't they? And, you know, what if you had a deadly disease and you were going to suffer? They always come out with the ones. You know what I mean? It's, they always throw the worst case scenario at you. And then you think, oh, well, that's, that's right. See, the trouble is, see, once you bring it in and you make it law, guess what? Boof, 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 boof. It... And then you can then, then it's law, and then you can actually use that law then, and you can bring it down, and you, before you know it, we're, we're doing away with a lot of people. I mean, I, we need to pray for our elderly. Because now, you know what they're trying to do? They're demonizing the elderly. Oh, you're useless. Oh, look at you. You're just going to take up space. And National Health Service is buckling. Look at you and you're done. Come on. You might as well just, and it's not glaringly so, but they actually are now just saying, well, come on. Is it not time? Why carry on? You're not even getting joy in life. Mom, so God is the God of life from birth to death. And he is the one that makes that decision. And we I've got no part to play in it. As soon as we step into the arena and say, well, we'll decide when you, how long you can live, then that's very dangerous, especially when you get to 64. That's why I'm working out and running like that. I'm, going to, I'm trying to keep as young as I can. Hallelujah. But it's the way, the trajectory of the world. So what we can see here, God is looking for to raise up a man after his own heart. God is looking to raise up warriors. You know, in Acts 32, 13, 13 22, it says this, Paul says, I found David, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. Amen. Do all of my will. Here's a man after my own heart. And do you know something? David wasn't perfect. But isn't it amazing how God chooses imperfect people? I'll get two hands up here. I can even put a wee leg up there as well. <laughs> Hallelujah. People look at you and say, oh, this guy's this guy. Well, look, you can, that's up to, well, I can't help God. God chose me. 
Get over it. <laughs> and that's the way it is. And I know the call of God upon my life. It's the only thing that's kept me in this pulpit. And um, actually, next year, we'll be 25 years as a church next year. And the 30th of January, so you can watch that space. Let me get back to, to this word here. So I just want to be... Let's go to the, 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 the book of Exodus. What we're going to be looking at is a great man, probably one of the greatest in Old Testament, which would be Moses. Hope I have not burst your bubble. But, uh, but Moses was one of the great heroes of the Old Testament. And here is a man that, you know, that God used powerfully. Let me just read some verses here. In verse, chapter Exodus 32, and verse 11, it says this. Now, this is off the incident of the golden calf. The people upset God. They, you know, they get fed up waiting for Moses. He's up the mountain too long. I mean, what's too long? 40 days. <laughs> Just less than 40 days. Well, what's happened to this man? We're fed up here. Make us a golden calf. And immediately the enemy, you know, get into the camp. And then before you know it, they've fallen sin in the out. They, they open up here. Now, listen to this. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with your mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out of harm and to harm them and to kill them in the mountains and to consume them in the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger ra ra and wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants to whom you swore to your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all of this land I have spoken I will give to their descendants as their inheritance forever. So the Lord relented from harm which he said he would do to his people. And here now the Lord is ready to consume Israel because of the sin that's it's, 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 it's went to. And, and Moses steps in. And he says, look, Moses, get the way. I'm going to destroy the people, but I'll make you into a great nation. Now, could you imagine that, guys, if you were there? You think, oh, that actually, that actually sounds okay, doesn't it? You're going to make me into a great nation? Get rid of all these people that are, you know, the, the good, the bad, and ugly? You could have a little pride there. But what does Moses do? And Moses steps into the gap. And stands before God and the people and says, Lord, how can you do such a thing? Lord, surely not. Surely not. And Moses now is in the gap, pleading with God in behalf of the people. Hallelujah. And it says this, and God relented. I think some version says that God repented. It means God relented. And God listened to a man. And he says, okay, Moses. Okay. I will do as you have asked me and God relented from his anger and Moses stood in the breach and was able to stand in the gap further up there in 33 as well we'll see another little instance 33 and 15 and then um, just to 17 to 17 now so God has relented but God says listen I'm going to send an angel with you to take you in the promised land he says but I can't go with you because if I go with you I'm going to end up killing a lot of you because of their, because of their sinfulness because God's holy and righteous and now, and, and now Moses st stops God in his process. God, Moses stops and says this, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we shall be separated, your people and I, from all the people who are on the face of the earth if you're not with us. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight and I know you by name. Now Moses again says, Lord, surely we're not moving from here. Unless you go with us, we ain't moving. We're staying here. Unless you go with us. How can you not go with us? And it says, God, listen to him. Moses stood in the gap again in behalf of the people. And it says, God, listen to him. Guys, don't you think that is amazing? And he said, well, that's Moses. <laughs> you know, that's Abraham. Do you know, the Bible says God is no respect to a person. God is no respect to a person. But all of us have got a right standing with him in Christ Jesus. If we live our lives right, we can't live your life any way and expect God to listen to you. But one tell you, when you get yourself in right with the Lord, hallelujah, he will do this wonderful thing. Let us remember, though, that Moses was a reluctant hero. Hallelujah. He was a reluctant hero. And you'll read that in Exodus 4. Moses ran into the desert. Remember, he tried to help his people and the people turned against him and then Pharaoh was going to kill him and he did a runner. I like that expression. I did a runner. You get that often, don't you? When the, heat, when the heat's on, we tend to do a runner and we get out of town. You run away, don't you? Uh, I know a lot of people that did the runners and he's actually up in 
uh, he's up in Glen Crow now, up that area, and um, you know, because the heat got too much for him here, there was a lot of pressure on him, a friend of mine, he was going to run into London, and somebody says, I forget London, he says, you might as well go up north, and so that's what he did, hallelujah, he did a runner up north, so praise the Lord, why is everybody wants to run away to London? So Moses does a runner, he's in the desert now, and he's, for 40 years he's been hiding out in the desert, he's made a life for himself, he enjoys the peace and the quiet. He's out there in the solitude. I want to tell you this. Have you ever walked about a, a desert area where you're watching sheep? And it's just you and the sheep under the stars at night. There's not, no noise. There's no blaring transistor radios. Your neighbors are making a mess. You're just a solitude and absolute peace now. And Moses is at peace with himself. But God now calls him. Now he has an encounter with a living God. And God says, Moses, I've chosen you for my plans and purposes. I'm going to send you into Egypt to get the people that commission that was 40 years before. I'm now recommissioning you to go and do the job. And of course, Moses is saying, Lord, surely not me. Lord, I'm not a very good speaker. I'm not that gifted. Surely, Lord. And he makes all of these excuses. And then when he can't wriggle out of it and make an excuse before God, because God answers every single one, Moses says, send somebody else. I can't be bothered. Lord, I can't be bothered, not me. The, the pressure that no, I just leave me, I'm happy in the desert. Send someone else. This is Moses, the mark of the man. Do you know, Moses has just become, he's, he's lost that zeal, that passion that he had to do the job. And he's been in the desert for far too long. And now he's just at home in the desert. And it's like, that's too much hassle for me. Send someone else. But do you know something God's refused? Do you know why? Because God had been working on him 40 years in Pharaoh's household. Then he'd been working with him for 40 years in the wilderness. He says, now you're ready for the task, Moses. And Moses was like, no, 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 someone else. But we know that the Lord didn't have someone else and he refused to let him go. And he says, no, Moses, you are the man. Hallelujah. I've got down here just to throw out to you. Is there anybody here? You might be stuck in the wilderness. You've had the call of God upon your life. You have maybe feel as if I've blown it. I've done a, you've done a runner. You've run away from the things of God. You might still be sitting in church, but you've not fulfilled the plan and your purpose in your life. You've been ducking and diving. You've just been sitting back. And um, I just believe maybe, you know, it's time. It's time for you this day. Have you lost your vision and your call of God? Do you know, the, praise God. I believe God is wanting to restore vision and God is wanting to restore that call again in your life. That call can be resurrected. Hallelujah. I brought a word on Sunday night. Uh, sorry, Friday night. And I just felt we're just looking at the end of the meeting. We're just talking about people. And, you know, and I just says, anybody feel they've got a word? I want you to find more of that happening in the prayer room, in the prayer gathering. And the place was kind of silent. I says, well, I've got, I says, I, I says I, what I'm feeling is I see that belt. You know, Jeremiah's belt. Some of your versions might say a sash. Now, God is using that as an illustration for the, church, for the people of Israel. And God says to Jeremiah, go buy yourself a belt. You know, and he's, he's, he's to tie it around his waist or a sash. And he's to, everybody sees him with this belt. And he says, now take the belt off and go and hide it in a cave or beside the water of the Euphrates River. He says, and leave it there for a long time. And then after a while, he goes, go and get the belt that you've hid and get it back out. And by this time, it's all moldy. It's, all, it's ruined. And he says, this, says the Lord, this is what Israel is like to me. I used to bind them around my loins. They were very close to me, but now they're useless. They're done. And there was that imagery. I used it in a positive sense. I used it to say, maybe you've had the call of God, but you've buried it. You've lost sight of it. It's been put away and you've, and you've carried on your life, but you forgot that call. And I would say, I, I believe the Lord is encouraging you. Go get it back again and revive it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Do you know, while there's still life in us, friends, we can revive a call of God upon us. You may think, well, I've blown it. You know, I've been, I've been a Christian a long time. And, you know, do you ever feel as if you're sitting, you've maybe just felt a little bit like deflated and you think there's something else, but I'm not actually, I, I, I feel as if I've, I've not got an opportunity just now. Do you know, Caleb came out of the wilderness. He was 82, maybe going in 84. And he came out there. This was a man now, full of, a fighting man. One of, the, one of the spies that actually held a good report. So he was allowed to come through while the rest of them all died. And he says, right. He says, see that whole country, Moses, that Moses promised me. It's mine. And I'm going to take it. This was a warrior. And he was up for a fight. And he did take it. Glory to God. So I don't care what age you are. You can always retrieve something. See, when God has given something to you, you might have lost it. But you know, remember the woman with the 10 coins? And she, lose, she lost one. And she was determined, by golly, it's a good word, Charles, by golly, I'm going to find that coin. And she, she refused to give up until she found it. And she found it, she was happy, happy as Larry. You think she still had nine? Well, she, she, 
Listen, when you're determined to find something, you'll find it, especially when it's in the Lord. Amen. And just say, Father, I just, I'm not trying to be something that, that, that I'm not, but I want, to be all, I want to be that what you've called me to be. That's always been the driving force. I'm not going to settle for the state of school. I went, Lord, sometimes I got up there and I got up there and I walk up there on the mountain, up to my mountains. It's a hill, by the way. You can think I'm walking up mountains every day, do you know what I mean? But it still takes effort to get there. You're still walking through dark and fields and, you know, whatever. And, you know, when I get there, I always say this, Lord, well, I don't always say it, but usually I've got to say it. I says, Lord, here I am. If you've got business with me, here I am. And I'm standing up there and I'm freezing up. You know, when they went and it's raining or something, I'm like, oh, brolly, that's not it. I'm here. If you get business with me, then here I am. Lord, let your will be done in my life. Lord, please, let your will. I just want your will to be done in my life. Please forgive me and I go through all this stuff. Lord, I feel sometimes hopeless and helpless and it's only me it looks like that. At least I'm not one of these guys. Lord, I'm the man. I'm so bright, I'm so handsome, I'm so good, I'm so happy. You get ministers like that, don't you? They walk out as if, you know, it's like, everybody starts applauding. And he stands here. And then he goes like this. I've seen him on TV and he goes like, oh, as if all the glory to him. You've just basked in the glory, my friend, for five minutes. And then he puts the wee hand up, but all the glory to God. Anyway, I don't want you unkind. Is a reality. Keep an eye on the time here. So here we see here, Moses now is now called and he can't get out of it. God has got a plan for that man's life. Listen, God's got a plan for all our lives. Okay, we might not be a Moses, we might not be a Paul or a Peter or a John, but I want to tell you this, God's got a plan for every single one of our lives. Trouble is, sometimes we just go through life and we don't even think we even want to know that plan. God's got a plan for every single person that's given their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a plan for your life, a DNA special to you, a fingerprint that is just unique to you. Hallelujah. And he's got a special plan for all of us. But not all of us will make that plan. Do you know why? Because sometimes we get caught up in the wilderness of life and yeah, we're going to get saved, but I missed the boat. I don't want to miss the boat. Amen. I might say, Lord, whatever you want for me, I'm in. And you need to spend time with him to find that. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Glory to God. What a wonderful verse that is. Now, obviously, the Lord is speaking here to the people of Israel because Jeremiah, and you'd have to read the chapters before then, and God will deal with them and, and bring nations against them. God will, God will judge them severely. But God will say, but I'm going to bring you back and I'm going to bless you and I'm going to prosper you after I brought the Babylonians against you. I've got down here as well. So Many Christians spend all their energy to be rich and comfortable, not knowing that they are actually spiritually poor. I mean, because they take that verse literally that God wants to bless me. So it's all about the blessings. You know, it's like, can I say, look at that watch there. It's dreadful. That's a cheap hill. I need to get a Rolex. And I've heard people saying that on the TV. See that old odd Audi out there I'm driving is rattling. Like nobody's business. It's an embarrassment. I need to get myself a Rolex. And you get that saying because I desire, I, God wants to bless me, so I need to. And they look at the blessings the wrong way. Now, listen, God can bless us, okay, brothers and sisters. But I want to tell you this that's not what the Lord is referring to. It's the spiritual blessings that the Lord is looking to. So many Christians un, sometimes are chasing the wrong things and, and they're missing what the, the real blessing of God is all about. Amen. It's not about having all the blessings in this life, although God takes care of us in this life, but He's talking about spiritual blessings. Hallelujah. Remember the church in Laodicea? And that you'll find that in the book of Revelations when God rebukes seven churches. Well, some of them, two of them, I think, uh, get a little bit of credit, but the other ones get a bit of, a, you know, a tongue lashing. Laodicea, you think you're rich, you think you're this, you think the next thing that says this. Don't you realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? You're lukewarm. Amen. And yet they had it all. Yeah, we've got everything. We're, we're doing great. We're rich. We're doing fine. And they thought, and yet the Lord says, actually, your riches is not what I consider riches. It's spiritual riches. It's the spiritual riches that the Lord is looking for. Hallelujah. Luke 12 and 15, and I want to quote the very words from Jesus himself and the book. What he says in, in Revelations is the very word of the Lord Jesus Christ also. He said to them, beware, keep yourselves from covetousness. Some of your verses will say Greed. For a man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of things which he possesses. A man's life and true riches is a spiritual dimension. 
It's a spiritual dimension. It's my growth in Christ. It's who I am in Christ. It's that spiritual. What you got in the realm of the spirit. Hallelujah. And I'm finishing shortly. So praise the Lord. Now we see Moses was a great man that stood in the gap before the people. Hallelujah. But there was one greater than Moses who came. Yeah, Moses stood in the gap for the Jewish people. But there was one who hung in a Calvary's cross, suspended between heaven and earth. And he stood not just for the Jewish people, he stood in the gap for the whole world. And do you remember those immortal words? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We don't know the significance of those words. Jesus hung before heaven and hell for every single person in the world and even us who were not born at that particular time. Do you know that Jesus hung there before the Father and he, and he, and he stood before heaven and earth and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. And he became our sacrifice. And the Father listened to the Son. And because of the Son's sacrifice, hey presto, he forgave us. He forgave me, a filthy sinner. Hallelujah. He forgave me, transformed me, gave me new life. I now become a son of God. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, brought into the kingdom of God. I've got hope and I've got a future. I've got a life, eternal. Hallelujah. I was saying that out in Paisley. I said, I'm going to live for eternal. The guy says, you're, on, you're, you're off your head, my friend. You're going to die. And, it, and, and you'll find it's nothing. I says, well, I want to tell you this. If there's nothing, I'll never know. I've given myself a happy thought. Hallelujah. And it's made me to be a better person. I'm no staggering through here and acid. And I was talking to a guy. That, he was still taking acid. This guy takes two taps, three taps, once every week. I mean, goodness sake. You know, and it's like, so I've been there. Did the tabs, did the magic mushrooms. I used to live in that world, you know. and Not in that world. It's a different world out there when you're tripping. And, he, I says, and the guy says, no, he loves it. He loves that world. He says, no, it's a great world. I can't, I can't wait every time I go and take I went, listen, can I tell you there's a better world than the world that you're experiencing? I don't need to take any pills to get there, my friend. You just need to surrender your life to Jesus. Hallelujah. And you will know that that world is all about. Jesus stood in the gap before us. And we've been called to walk in his footsteps. Brian, I want to just want to finish that. You know, it's like we might not be asked to stand in the gap for a nation or, or for great things, but there might be your wee neighbor that's just over the path from you. There might be a good friend that you've got that's maybe in a very struggling and a bad situation. Do you know that you can stand before God and plead their case and say, Father, can I pray? And can I pray for my family? Can I pray for my kids? Do you know that there's, can I, can I pray for these, for these people that maybe you've got, maybe you've had a history of drug or drink, and you've got a real passion for that. You say, Lord, can I just pray for these poor souls that are stuck in alcoholism or, or, or drug addiction and stand before God and say, oh, Lord, please, can, I, can, you, can you forgive them? You saved me, can you save them? Lord, you set me free, can you set them free? Hallelujah. Do you ever get a passion? You maybe see somebody's going by you and there's a wee kid can put, get him wheeled by you in a wheelchair. Does that not do something to you? It does something to me. And then I beat myself up and says, Lord, I should be in a better place where I could, I could get myself into a place and I might be able to touch you in a powerful way that I could do, reach out my hand and just say, wouldn't it be wonderful to see a wee youngster coming out of a wheelchair? Well, if my kid was in a wheelchair, I want to tell you this, it'd be wonderful for me. And you need to feel the pain. Jesus felt the pain of the world. He had compassion. He looked at people and his heart went out to them. And then he would stand in the gap before the Father and intercede for us. And then he reached out and he would touch them, amen. God is looking for a people who are willing to walk to stand the gap. You know, it might be, maybe God wants to, maybe God wants to bring healing in a, in a powerful way to all, the, to all the things that we're seeing. Maybe God wants to, but he's looking for somebody who has to stand in the gap and plead the case. The Lord says, I look for someone to stand in the gap. Brothers and sisters, we are the people of God. We are the ones that need to stand before God and start to plead for this world. Not to say, like, remember John, Lord, would you want me to call down some fire and fry them because they refused to receive the Christ on one of his journeys? Jesus says, rebuked them and says, you don't know what spirit you're at. No, we should be praying, oh, Father, save them. They don't know what they're doing. These people are blind, Lord. Going to, going to, going to, going to show favor to them. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, can I encourage us this morning on this, on this trajectory? We are the people that should be standing in the gap. All of us have been called to stand in the gap. Might be a small gap, might be a big gap. Maybe God will put you in a place where you can stand before him and, 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 and represent big, big, 
you know, praying for a nation. For God says, I look for someone to stand in the gap in behalf of the land. Hallelujah. Do you know when I stand before God up in that hill, I always pray for Scotland because it's my land. Hallelujah. And I say, oh God, please, look at the state of my nation. Look at the state of this land. Oh Lord, please be merciful. Oh Lord, please show favor again to this nation. Oh Lord, please send your Holy Spirit to our nation. Raise up warriors. Raise up the prophetic mantle. Raise up, oh Lord, giants in the nation that are going to speak out. Listen, it's time for us to rise out and speak out. The enemy's been screaming and shouting and putting all this filth into our environment. It's time that we found our voice and we stood up before God, not only to stand there in the gap, but we need to be a prophetic voice to say enough is enough. Let us rise up. I believe that's the season that we're in that God is looking for people. Who will stand? Now, who's willing to stand? Do you know, when you take a stand and you want to enter that field, all hell is going to break loose. But glory to God, hallelujah. May the Holy Spirit be let loose. And we will see a powerful move of God again in one nation. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage us today. All of us have got the call of God upon our lives. All of us have got something to offer. All of us have got something to give. So often we just maybe sit in it and we just don't realize what we have got. If you've got Jesus and you've committed your life to him and repented your sins and been born again by the Spirit of God, all of us have got, a me- have got the Holy Spirit living within us to our measure. Let us allow the Holy Spirit within us to rise up and let us reach out and let's turn this nation around for the glory of God. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you this morning. Father, I thank you for the call of God upon our lives. I thank you, Lord. There is no nobodies in this room, Father. There's no nobodies. <laughs> We're all somebody in Christ Jesus, your glorious Son. Every one of us are unique. Every one of us, Lord God, individually, Lord God, Father, are unique. You know us by name. You know who we are. You've called us by your spirit. You've brought us into the kingdom of God, into the Son. And Lord God, we just thank you afresh for that. And I just pray, stir us up this morning. I pray, Lord, that you will revive us. I pray, Lord, if anybody, Lord, is stuck in a wilderness and there's that sense of that calling, that, Lord, that they feel as if it's gone, can I pray, Lord, that you will remind them of their calling? And can I pray, Lord God, that you will encourage them, Lord, Father, like the persistent widow, Lord God, Father, to keep calling upon you until you restore that call upon their lives, Lord. In Jesus' glorious name. Amen. And amen. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.